I want to welcome everybody to this very special event. Uh, this is the first inaugural session of the Abigail St Scott Dunaway Speaker Series. And we have a very special program here today. My name is Larry Wallach. I'm the Dean of the College of Urban and Public Affairs, and I'm really very pleased to be able to participate in this. Somebody else, Mary Miller, is going to introduce our two uh, very distinguished faculty member, one former faculty member, sadly, I have to say. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about Ab Abigail Scott Dunaway, because this is a very interesting person, and it's, it's important that we know who the series is named after and why the series is named after her, and why this particular topic today, this book, is so well suited to opening the speaker series. So let me tell you a little bit about her because it really is an interesting story. She was born in 1834 in Illinois and she was one of 10 children. And when she was 17 years old, her family got into a cart pulled by oxen and headed out for the Oregon Trail. This also reminds me of Barbara Roberts, not that Barbara came on the Oregon Trail. <laughs> and I don't even suggest that, but, but. Be careful uh, there, Larry. <laughs> yeah, but but Bar Barbara, who can't be here today, but who's been a great supporter of, of the center, uh, Barbara's family came across on the Oregon Trail. And that, that sort of indomitable spirit and that striving for social justice and equality that Barbara has is certainly represented in Abigail as well. And I think that, that stock is coming across on that Oregon Trail is something to be reckoned with. Her mother and one of her brothers died en route, and the rest of the family ended up in Lafayette in the Oregon Territory. And I wonder whether when Abigail was standing by the side of her mother's grave outside of Fort Laramie, whether she could have imagined that her own life would be such a long one and that her own life would, in fact, change history. In 1853, at the age of 18, Abigail Scott married Benjamin Dunaway, and they had five children. The family moved to Portland in 1871 after some financial setbacks and the failure of the family farm, and an injury to her husband left her as the sole support and main support for the family. Beginning in 1870, Dunaway worked tirelessly for women's rights throughout the Northwest. She founded a newspaper, New Northwest, in 1871. By the way, one of her brothers founded a newspaper also, and just as her newspaper advocated for women's rights, his newspaper was on the other side. <laughs> and they were diametrically opposed on this issue. She managed a speaking tour of the Northwest by Susan B. Anthony in 1871 and re received important advice about politics and organizing from Susan B. Anthony. Could she have possibly conceived at that time that the likeness of the woman who was giving her this advice would be imprinted, imprinted on a $1 coin? Although many of us probably don't even know that Susan B. Anthony is on a $1 coin, but it's true, and I have one at home. It just never <laughs> went on. Uh, Abigail shortly thereafter founded the Oregon State Women's Suffrage Association and traveled the state advocating for equal rights. And by doing so, she subjected herself to verbal and physical assaults as well. So this was not an easy thing. And you have to remember, is a pioneer person. And she was a pioneer. She was a pioneer in terms of coming across the Oregon Trail, in terms of uh, being the first book publisher in Oregon, publishing uh, one of her own books. In fact, she published five books altogether. Of being an editor and a publisher of a newspaper. Of being a, bus a businesswoman and having just all kinds of experiences that shaped her. So in 1884, a women's suffrage referendum was defeated in Oregon. And the Oregon State Equal Suffrage Association fell apart. From 1887 to 1895, Dunaway lived in Idaho working for suffrage there. And a suffrage re referendum finally passed in Idaho in 1896. Subsequently, uh, suffrage passed in Washington State in 1910. Oregon was lagging behind. Dunaway returned to Oregon and revised, revived the Suffrage Association and began another publication, the Pacific Empire newspaper. The Empire advocated for women's rights just like the previous newspaper called Far, uh, New West had done. In 1905, Dunaway published a novel, From the West to the West, 
with the main character moving from Illinois to Oregon. Another women's suffrage re referendum had failed in Oregon in 1900, and the National American Women's Suffrage Association or organized a suffrage referendum campaign in Oregon for 1906, and Dunaway left the state suffrage organization and did not participate in that one, and the 1906 referendum failed as well. Dunaway then returned to the fight, organized new referenda in 1908 and 1910, both of which failed, and this tells you something about the perseverance that she had and the deep, the, the, the deep depth with which she was committed to this. But in 1912, there was yet another referendum, and although Dunaway's health was failing and she was in a wheelchair, she was able to participate somewhat, and in fact, the 1912 one passed. And when that 1912 ref referendum finally succeeded in granting women the full franchise, the governor asked Dunaway to write the proclamation in recognition of her long role in the struggle. Dunaway was the first woman in her county to register to vote and is, being, and is credited with being the first woman in the state to actually vote. Abigail Scott Dunaway completed and published her autobiog autobiography, which was called Pathbreaking, and you can see why, in 1914, and she died the following year. Could she have imagined, could she have conceived of, upon finishing her autobiography in 1914, that less than 100 years later, a black man and a white woman would be in a down-to-the-wire race to become the next president of the United States? I think she could. Not only did I think she could have, I think she must have and that she did. Because otherwise, what could have motivated her to dedicate her life to the kind of equality that would make such a thing possible? She would have had to have had a vision where she could have conceived of the kinds of things that we today take for granted. Well, I'm very pleased. Uh, before I turn it over, I just do want to say briefly something about uh, Melody and Regina. Uh, Melody is just one of our super faculty here at Portland State. She just is one of the best at balancing scholarship, service to the community, service to the profession, and teaching, and keeping it all together. And it's not like she meets the criteria. She is just far beyond what most other people do, and certainly second to none in the university. And as dean of the college, I love Melody. <laughs> because she just makes me look good and she gives me so much to talk about and so much to be proud of and I am grateful to Melody for that. Also, Regina, who came here about the same time I did and then uh, left and when she left she really did leave a hole in, in many of us but Regina is just one of the best colleagues that I've ever had and I did have the opportunity before she left, Regina and I published a paper together. And it was, uh, my background's public health, she's political science, it was published in the American Journal of Public Health. And I say this all the time, it is the best paper I have ever published. It has gotten the most response, and I think had the greatest impact, and it was because Regina had the persistence of Abigail Scott Dunaway <laughs> really, in pushing me to keep going with this. So I'm just so pleased, Regina, that you're back. Melody, I'm so pleased that you're here and hopefully not going anywhere. <laughs> Maybe one day we can get Regina back. And now I want to ask Mary Miller, who is the vice chair of the uh, uh, Center for Women, Politics, and Policy. Uh, and I want to thank you. And by the way, I want to thank all the board members who are here and all the other people who have supported the center. And I want to recognize uh, Secretary of State Kate Brown. I want to recognize uh, former legislator Jane Cease, and I'm probably missing some other people, but uh, it's people like you who have excelled in public life and then have come back and supported. Is there, am I missing somebody else, Jane? You? Betty. Oh. And Jewel Lansing. Jewel Lansing is here as well. And Danielle. I just want to. Now I'm in front of you. <laughs> But I just want to thank you all. And I think what we're going to hear today is a testament, not only to the people who have recorded it and who have carried on the struggle, but those of you who have been in the struggle for so long. So thank you very much. Let's hear more about our guest today.
right height. I'm a little shorter oh. than you are, but I think this is works. Well, um, thank you for all the thank yous, Dean Wallach. We, um, on behalf of the board and the alum and the program participants and donors, uh, we do want to sincerely thank you for all the support that you've given to the Center for Women, Politics, and Policy. Uh, we couldn't have achieved what we have in such a short time without your dedication, and for that we are very, very grateful. Um, welcome to the first of uh, many Abigail Scott Dunaway a series we hope to have. Um, thank you for so much for joining us today. Um, this is a moment we've been waiting for for quite some time, and it's a perfect addition to the components of the center that um, currently serve the community. Um, as Dr. Rose told me yesterday, it's something that academic centers do. Uh, it's presenting research to the public, sharing knowledge, and encouraging our city to interface with our university. And so it's our hope that this is a regular event that provides many perspectives, and some speakers will be academic, and others will be experts on domestic and international issues in the future. And we hope to bring in some political actors as well. So stay tuned. Um, this will be a great event today, and the future ones will be equally exciting. Um, Dean Wallach did a fantastic job giving a, a historic overview of Abigail Scott Dunaway. Um, I do have a hard time listening sometimes, and I'm not sure if you did cover this one point, but one thing I found uh, particularly interesting in learning about her was that I think she did uh, run for president at one point, um, but she did not receive her party's nomination. So what a fitting uh, topic that we have uh, for today at this speaker. And um, I do want to talk a little bit about history uh, briefly, but more um, in the 1970s. Uh, as I was preparing for today, I was listening uh, to an album, and I was wondering if some of you know what it is. Have any of you heard Free to Be You, you and Me? Oh, yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Oh, I hope a lot. Okay, so uh, I was listening to it with my daughter, and I wanted to read just real briefly a couple of lyrics that I thought were very telling. Uh, Marla Thomas, uh, as many of you know, was called That Girl uh, way back when, and she was really concerned about genders and stereotypes that were in children's songs and books at the time. So she and um, uh, I can't recall who wrote this book, or this song, it was called Parents Are People, but there's a lyric in here that says, some mommies are ranchers, or poetry makers, or doctors or teachers, or cleaners or bakers, some mommies drive taxis, or sing on TV, yeah, mommies can be almost anything they want to be. <laughs> Y'all know this song? <laughs> so, no mention of running for president, and I thought this was such a forward-thinking album at the time, <laughs> but 36 years later, uh, it did indeed happen, and, um, but it is still quite surprising that gender and media played such a role on the outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, regardless if you, how you feel about the 2008 election, I think you'll find today's discussion fascinating because it's neither pro nor con Hillary. It's a thoughtful, deliberate, deliberate academic perspective. And we have an opportunity today to hear from these scholars who aren't activists and their completed work rests in a three-way intersection of the academic exper their academic ex expertise, which is politics, gender, and the media. So with that, I'll tell you a little bit about the co-authors of Hillary Clinton's Race for the White House, Gender Politics and the Media on a Campaign Trail. Uh, Dr. Regina Lawrence is the Kevin P. Riley Senior Chair and Professor of Mass Communication and Political Science at Louisiana State University. Her teaching and research interests focus on the analysis of po politics and public policy issues, event-driven news, and journalistic norms. And this is her third book that she's completed. Dr. Rose is Chair of the Political Science of political science at the Hatfield School of Government here at Portland State. She teaches courses in American government and politics and holds degrees from Santa Cruz and Cornell University. She's also authored a number of articles and this is her third book as well. And Portland State was where you two met, I, I learned. Um, and again, uh, send, you all know about the Center for Women Politics and Policy. I just want to mention real quick our mission before we get going. It is to increase women's leadership in public policy through targeted teaching and community service programs. Uh, we do have uh, question cards on your seats, so uh, we encourage you to ask those. Um, they'll be collected toward the um, end of their presentation, and then, of course, we'll have some books um, that you can purchase, and uh, they will be autographed at the end. So with that, I am very delighted and honored to introduce Drs. Lawrence and Rose.
thank you all so much for being here. It's very nice to look out on a sea of friendly faces. Um, and I know most of you here today, and I'm very grateful that you're supportive of all that we do at the center. And before I launch in, uh, I want to also give a real thanks uh, to our staff, without whom this would not be possible. We have an amazing group of volunteers and staff at the center who make everything we do possible. So we're very grateful for them. And I have to say, uh, in academic publishing, it's a rare treat to write a book with your friend and come out better friends <laughs> when the book is done. And so it's a real uh, testament, I think, to our friendship and our commitment to one another. And I'm very grateful to have my friend uh, with me here today. So um, without further ado, of course, you all know the title of our book. And we worked long and hard on the title, uh, and I, won't, I will spare you those details, but they include many arguments in uh, San Francisco, San Diego, Washington, D.C., and Baton Rouge, where we were writing this book. I think it's really important uh, to set the stage in thinking about this book by telling you how we approached our subject. And I want to spend a moment on that precisely because our subject matter is so controversial and so loaded in a sense, right? Nobody comes to the title of our book without expectations. Nobody comes to the title of our book without assumptions about our positionality on the race, about whether we had a dog in the fight. And we do talk a little bit about this in the preface to the book, about how we were positioned as we approached our subject matter. But as a scholarly matter, we were very careful in all that we did to consider all of the things that contributed to the outcome of the 2008 Democratic primary process. And you see, uh, in a very simplistic way, but I think a way that captures our thinking in this Venn diagram, we were very careful that we would look at gender stereotypes, of course, but that we were also considerate in looking at all of the evidence of what affected this race to consider the way in which the media's own professional norms and routines contributed to the way that the race was covered and to some degree to the outcome of that race. And finally, it cannot be, we cannot miss the fact that the specific players in this campaign made a difference that it was not an insignificant race in so many ways. And we have to acknowledge in our analysis all of the ways in which the candidate and her entire context affect the way in which she performed and the way in which she was received. Now, all of that being said, I think it's a fair thing to suggest that the presidency is a masculinized institution. In fact, I would dare go farther than that to say that it may be the most macho job on the planet. <laughs> so I think even though we take a very balanced view in the way we look at the evidence and scrutinize that in a very scholarly balanced way, I think we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the fact that this is a hyper-masculinized role and that that creates a certain context in, when, in which women must run that we have to acknowledge. And within that, of course, we can think about a couple of anecdotal pieces of evidence. One is that the whole image of the commander in chief is a very masculinized image, right? It's a tough guy image. Uh, it's usually a militarized image. There's a lot that goes, that conjures up with that phrase, which is very masculinized in the American culture. And I think we would be remiss to not acknowledge that that is the case. We also find, and I think Regina was probably the first to bring this to my attention, how often the presidency is described in sports language. Now just think back to the race, uh, and, and this applies to all of the candidates who were running for this office. So much of the time, the race is characterized in terms of moving the ball down the field, or what are some of the other things, Regina? Boxing, right? Getting on the gloves. Um, note. None of the sports are feminine sports. We don't talk about women's volleyball <laughs> in presidential elections. We don't talk about ballet in presidential elections. So not only do we have uh, a sports mentality about the presidency and the campaign for the presidency, the sports that are often chosen in media framing of the US presidency are the most masculinized sports that we could select from. And then, of course, we have to acknowledge the fact 
that the office is masculinized by definition because no woman has ever occupied it. So by virtue of that simple fact of history, the office uh, in our minds as voters and consumers of news during a presidential cycle conjures masculine concepts. Now this doesn't affect just women. <laughs> and I put this slide in here very deliberately to remind us that a gendered context does not just affect women candidates. And we all giggle when we see this image of poor Mike Dukakis on the take. Doing what? Trying to be macho. Trying to be as hyper-masculinized as he could be in the race for the presidency. So I think it is fair to say, and it's important to say, that gender doesn't just show up on the campaign trail when a woman runs. Gender politics is there and infuses the entire environment, whether the candidates are female or male. And very oftentimes in presidential elections, even when all of the candidates are male, we see gender politics underway. Uh, you may recall some of the ways in which this is true. I think probably no one puts a finer point on this than Maureen Dowd of the New York Times, who so oftentimes <laughs> puts the finest point on gender politics. And, and Regina and I, throughout the writing of our book, were shooting each other Maureen Dowd quotes across the country back and forth faster than the speed of light, it felt like, at times. But the quote is chosen here specifically because it's in reference to a male candidate who is feminized through this language, and that feminization undermines his his, uh, or the portrayal, the image of him, the legitimacy of his candidacy. So I think those of you who have run campaigns, who watch campaigns very closely, will recall cases where male candidates are undermined by feminizing them. And this is something that I think we can uh, track over time and is not something clearly that has gone away. The way we approached this book then was for us to think about the double binds that any woman would have to face as she enters this masculinized context. So if we assume that there are many things that affect US presidential campaigns, but that one of those things surely is the fact that women are trying to seek a masculinized office, how would this manifest itself in the production of a race? There are four ways in which we say in the book that women face a double bind in seeking the presidency. Two of these, the first two on our list, are, are produced by a colleague of ours um, whose work we respect very much, Kathleen Hall Jameson, who has talked about the first two. The second two, which I'll get to in a moment and unpack here for you, are our uh, judgments about the kinds of things that Hillary Clinton specifically faced in 2008. So let me just go over these for a moment. Some of them may be more obvious than others. One of the double binds that Jameson, I think, taught us long ago is that because of sex stereotypes, because of gender politics, women who run for masculinized roles must walk this tightrope between femininity and competence. And I see many of you who have run campaigns nodding your heads. So this double bind is very poignant in the case of a presidential campaign because it is one of the most masculinized contexts that a candidate will face. On the one hand, the candidate who presents as very feminine in physical appearance, in issue alliance, uh, in the way in which she speaks about those issues, is often portrayed as incompetent. Perhaps not smart, maybe not tough enough, maybe vacant a little bit, um, too soft to really get the job done. On the other hand, on the other side of this tightrope walk is the need for competence. And obviously we want all of our candidates to be competent and to be viewed as competent. But what happens to candidates, female candidates, who seek a masculinized office, if they err too far on the side of competence, is they are no longer women. They are no longer viewed as appropriately feminine. So the bind that we see here for women facing the White House is that very delicate tightrope walk between appropriate levels of femininity 
and the required level of competence for the job. Secondly, Jameson, I think, and, and somewhat similar to the first BIME, Jameson points out that this creates for candidates a tension between presenting themselves to the voting population as equal to their male competitors, right? I'm going to sit on the dais with all of the men and I'm going to play in this game like the men, on the one hand, to deciding to run as a difference candidate, right? Distinguish oneself. I'm not like the men on the dais. I have different life experiences. I think differently. I behave differently. That, too, can become quite a double bind and one that we see in the case of Clinton. The last two are, are binds that we identified in looking specifically at the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. And these are double binds that we are very curious to see, to test, if they come up for future presidential candidates uh, who are yet to be identified. So let me say a little bit about these. Clinton faced a real bind, we argue in the book, between presenting herself as the voice of experience. You need me because I've been there and I've done that. And on the other hand, how can a woman running for the White House not be an agent of change? By virtue of her mere existence in the race, she is an agent of change. And yet, I think because women face that uphill battle in terms of establishing their credibility, their competence for a job no woman has ever held, they have to walk this tightrope again very, very carefully. And one slip to one side or the other, and you're off the tightrope. Finally, and we see this specifically in the case of Clinton, and we look forward to future female candidates that we can test this theory with, is the double bind that we call independence versus dependence. What do we want in a presidential contender? Independence. We want strength. We want character. We want a level of fierceness and tenacity. That's the independence. And I think Clinton had those things in, in great uh, degree, to, uh, uh, some would argue. On the other hand, we often think of women, in particular, as being dependent, right, connected to others, in sometimes in relational ways that socially we view as positive attributes, level of connectivity. In the case of Hillary Clinton, who happened to be connected to someone who had been president before, this notion of dependence conjured very particular liabilities for her. And this is why we say she was very carefully walking this tightrope between independence, not wanting to be so independent that she was strident, and on the other hand, trying to acknowledge the context from which she comes without seeming to be uh, an afterthought, right? Bill's third term. So all of that is particular to Hillary Clinton, and I think we look forward to being able to test some of these ideas uh, in the future. So let me turn this over to Regina to tell you a little bit about how we tested some of these ideas. Okay. Oh, good. All right. There it is. I don't want to interrupt the flow, but I do certainly want to take just at least a quick moment to thank Melody and Larry and the center and all of you for the opportunity to talk to you about this work that we're very, very proud of. And it was indeed a great pleasure to be able to work uh, with Melody on this book. We're very proud of it. Um, what I would like to talk about for a moment is one set of questions that we examine in this book, and that is how do the media cover Hillary Clinton's campaign? And then we'll go on and talk more about how she ran, how she presented herself. But first I'd like to talk a little bit about our findings on the media coverage. Um, we derived some hypotheses about how the media were likely to cover her campaign uh, based on previous studies that have been done, done of women candidates in lots of other contexts. Of course, we haven't had the opportunity to study very many women presidential candidates, uh, although some of that study has been done. So we mostly had to derive our uh, educated guesses from studies of women who had run for governor's seats, the Senate, the House, et cetera. And these are the basic hypotheses that the literature would have predicted, that Hillary Clinton would have, as a woman, received less coverage than of her male opponents, 
that um, the media would have emphasized her, uh, her appearance, her physical appearance, her family status, and other gender-related attributes more than they would have emphasized such things for her male competitors. Um, that the media would be more likely to drop her official title to refer to her in more informal kinds of ways rather than as Senator Clinton. Um, that the media would have emphasized this narrative of her being first because she was the first female candidate with a serious shot at the presidency. That there would have been a lot of attention to the novelty of that which some scholars argue is in a weird way a backhanded compliment because it calls attention to the quote unquote abnormality of a woman being on the presidential stage. And that finally she would have her political viability questioned more frequently that the media would express greater doubts about her ability to win the nomination or to go on and win the general election. I'll quickly run through with you the basic answers to these questions, but then I want to elaborate a little bit in a more qualitative way. Um, we found a mixture of findings, a mixture of ways in which the literature was either um, seemingly uh, proven to be true or maybe not so much in this case. Uh, did she receive less coverage than her competitors? No, not according to our study of mainstream news coverage, and I do need to emphasize the mainstream news that we focused on, the leading national newspapers like the New York Times and the evening network broadcasts. Those are what we derived most of our data from. So actually, she didn't receive less coverage than either Barack Obama or John McCain, uh, at least if you t look at the race overall. Now there was a certain point at which she did start to receive less coverage and you can probably all guess about when that was. That was around March of 2008, right? When it became pretty clear that if you did the delegate math, she was having an increasingly difficult uh, chance of actually winning the nomination. And at that point, her coverage did begin to slip vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Barack Obama. Did the media emphasize her appearance uh, actually, other scholars have begun to examine this as well, and I think we're all concurring, that no, not overly much. In fact, it looks as though in this way, uh, the media did focus less on her physical characteristics, her manner of dressing. They didn't even focus as much on her hairdo as they had done in the past when she was in the White House. But in another sense, they paid quite a lot of attention to her family status, if you will, but that's for a very understandable reason. She's married to a former president who, of course, was a major force in her campaign and ended up being a major newsmaker, for better or for worse, uh, in his own right during her campaign. So yes, there was lots of discussion of Bill Clinton in the coverage of Hillary Clinton. This speaks to one of the particular double binds that Melody was speaking about a moment ago. It was virtually impossible for Hillary Clinton to be seen in her own right as her own woman, as it were, uh, with Bill kind of constantly hanging around in the background. Were they more likely to use her first name than her official title? Well, no, and yes. We actually find that she did not, um, she, she was referred to as senator pretty much as often as both Barack Obama and John McCain. On the other hand, she was also referred to more often by her first name. But here again, we come to the difficulties of studying any one electoral race, particularly with the political figure of Hillary Clinton. We all, I think, have been in the habit of referring to Senator Clinton and now Secretary of <laughs> State Hillary Clinton as Hillary for a long time. And as a matter of fact, as you know, her campaign chose, they made a decision to run her as Hillary. And that was made apparently for a couple of reasons. One was to humanize her more because um, you know, the, the general feeling about her was that she had trouble sometimes showing a more human and personable side, especially to very large audiences. And also, again, to distinguish her from Bill. This is Hillary Clinton who's running this time, not Bill. So the campaign made the choice, and you probably remember, and perhaps some of you have displayed, the Hillary lawn signs, etc. So in other words, the literature didn't hold up in this particular case, there's a very good set of reasons why the, the media may have referred to her more often by her first name. Are we comfortable with that? That's still a very interesting and lively question. Was that a good choice for Hillary Clinton to make? That's certainly something we could discuss. Um, we did find some evidence that there was some, ev uh, some emphasis on her novelty as the first female candidate with a serious shot at the White House. However, I think one of the more interesting findings of our book is the degree to which the Hillary Clinton campaign itself de-emphasized at many turns 
her historic candidacy. There were opportunities that the Clinton campaign had to actually make it more clear that Hillary Clinton was indeed the first woman who might occupy the White House. And in fact, for a variety of reasons that we'll discuss in a few minutes, the campaign backed away from that at different points during the campaign. So we find that the media did not focus as much as you might have expected on the historic nature of this candidacy. Often, in fact, we found that when there were references to historic candidacy, those phrases were often in conjunction with Barack Obama. So those two candidacies got linked together. What a historic campaign because we have a woman and an African-American contending for the nomination. But what didn't happen nearly as often was a discussion, a recognition of the amazingly historic nature of her win, for example, in New Hampshire, uh, which really didn't get very much discussion. Certainly nothing like the discussion that was focused on Barack Obama's win in Iowa, which was, of course, historic in its own right. Um, finally, was her viability uh, talked about more? Uh, again, yes and no, and it's mixed. And part of the reason that it's mixed, and here's something that we really need to touch on for just a moment, um, I come to this study as a scholar of the media, first and foremost. And so my expectation going into this project was that we would see a lot of what we call the horse race coverage, where the media focus much less on the substantive policy issues that the candidates might be discussing. And they focus much more on the who's up and who's down. Who's pulling ahead, who's pulling behind, what are the strategies and tactics that they're using, you know, why are they falling behind with voters, et cetera. And indeed, we found that in greater amounts in this election than in any previous election, as best we can tell. And those findings have also been uh, verified, I think, by the Project for Excellence in Journalism, which has done similar comparisons. We had unprecedented levels of horse race coverage in the 2008 nominating race. So what that meant is that, yes, indeed, there was a lot of discussion of Hillary Clinton's political viability. And it did, because of the dynamics of the campaign, focus more often on her than on Barack Obama. Again, because at a certain point in the campaign, his viability, his continued viability was more or less assured and hers was very much in doubt. So we did find a lot of discussion of that, but for some rather well-grounded reasons. Let me just to give you a flavor of some of the uh, analyses that we did, this is a very uh, simplified rendering of the amount of negative coverage of Hillary Clinton, who's displayed with the red line, versus Barack Obama, that's the yellow line, and John McCain. We wanted to really bring in the competitor from the other side of the aisle to present a more balanced analysis. This is really based on whether um, an individual news article had any negative discussion of the, campaign, of the uh, candidate. And what you can see here is that uh, Hillary Clinton's coverage is significantly more negative. And I can tell you, based on our statistical analyses, that these differences are statistically significant, not just on their face significant. She gets significantly more negative coverage throughout most of the campaign. When does that drop off? It drops off in May, when it's virtually assured at that point that she's not really a viable contender for the nomination anymore. And of course, she then formally withdraws from the race early in June. Uh, that's just one piece of evidence to suggest that she did come in for much more negative criticism and coverage than the other candidates in the race. Now again, we turn to Maureen Dowd, such a great exemplar of the kind of, some of the sort of snarky commentary that we did find in the mainstream media, which is nothing compared to the commentary one could find on the internet or even here in cable news, political talk radio. Why this quote, I'll let you read it for yourselves, but why this quote is very interesting to us is it really captures, I think, the outcome of these double binds that Hillary Clinton faced. It really captures the difficulty that she had in striking just the correct balance in all of these double binds, that she was perceived as being Sybil, perceived as being schizophrenic, perceived as being manic depressive, perceived as being on some days too emotional, on some days you know, too tight-lipped, too uh, you know, re uh, held in, et cetera. Um, and this, we think, really gets at some of the difficulties that she faced as a candidate. So I'm going to let Melody talk then for a few minutes about how Hillary Clinton did position herself in the race. <coughs> This is the other side of the coin, of course. We can talk about how the media covered her, but what is also interesting to us is 
how did she run? How did she choose to present herself to the public? And within that, we have to appreciate that she had to make decisions, she and her campaigns had to make decisions about how to present her uh, as a female contender for an office that no woman has ever held. So within this context, um, we expected that a woman would run for this office emphasizing her experience, her credentials, and her policy positions to some degree to overcome stereotypes um, that we've already talked about here. So that would certainly be our expectation. We would also expect to find that a woman running for the White House uh, as possibly the first woman ever to hold that office would present herself as having the same qualifications as her male competitors, same or better qualifications as those who have held office previously and not play up too terribly much the historic qualities of her candidacy, which in some ways only remind the public that no woman has occupied this office before. And then finally, and this is a, a fine point, I think, but it goes to some of the visual messaging that we would expect a female candidate for this office to present. We would expect to find that a woman running for this office would present herself in very formal dress, uh, would appear most frequently by herself, not with her family, so as to remind the public who her family is. Uh, and I think that um, for the most part, uh, we find these hypotheses to be true. And you can test them against your own experience of watching the race in 2008. We certainly find Clinton from the beginning emphasizing her experience, sometimes to a fault, as we re recall from earlier in the campaign when she talked about her foreign policy credentials, which were tested by the media, tested by others, uh, and in some very poignant cases, not borne out by the evidence. So I think that, that we can appreciate the impulse she had towards solidifying experience, uh, given what we know about women running for this office. We also found that she very consistently uh, reminded the public that she had the same qualities uh, as other presidential contenders, other, the others who have held office, and we find her very consistently standing alone at the podium in a formal attire. We find in our study Barack Obama much less likely to appear, appear in a suit, for instance, as Hillary Clinton. And we can talk more perhaps in the question and answer about why that might be so. The thing I want to point out, though, is that there was an unexpected finding through all of this, which is somewhat what we had predicted. But along the more surprising lines, is the sense that we got very early on in the research that Hillary Clinton was faced with creating a very complex gender strategy. And this is something that we have now talked about quite extensively um, in this book and, and beyond in some of our more recent work, that essentially women faced with these offices must have a gender strategy as a component of their overall campaign strategy. And again, I see some of the women who have held office before shaking their heads nodding in agreement in the room. What I want to suggest is that for the most part, as the previous slide indicated, Clinton chose to present herself in some ways as one of the guys. The same credentials, the same hard-hitting points of view, very uh, formalized dress. But we also all know, having lived through this campaign, that there were exceptions to that rule, really significant exceptions to that rule uh, that we must remind ourselves of. And we find specifically that there were a couple of points along the campaign trail early on when Clinton was finding her footing, essentially, trying to land on the appropriate gender strategy, where we do see some signals of greater uh, efforts at femininity and, in a sense, sort of testing some of that messaging it appeared to us. We see her show appearing on more feminine shows like Tyra Banks and The View, right? Those are uh, very particular decisions that the campaign makes. The website, of course, airing things, uh, very personal vignettes about the Hillary I know, trying to draw upon the more personal side of the candidate. And of course, uh, some of the web ads that we see during the campaign, talking about Hillary Clinton as a mom, talking about Hillary Clinton in her more feminine roles. So we do know that there was some experimentation with this gender strategy. Uh, it wasn't all tough and macho. Early on we see <clears throat> some efforts. 
around the femininity side of this. Now, this draws us to what I would refer to as Clinton's testosterone blitzkrieg, which happened in March, we like to recall Manly March, because there was a, and you will remember the time in which, the, what, the time of the campaign. March was a very difficult point in the nominating campaign. Clinton was losing her footing, and we see the campaign make multiple, very, uh, almost aggressively masculinized messages throughout the course of this month. And these are some of the most blatant examples. Uh, we have others in the book, but you can see here, and each of these individuals who are quoted for you here uh, is, is basically a surrogate for the campaign. So each of these individuals is speaking on behalf of or as part of the campaign. And the effort really feels here in March like a very powerful last ditch effort to establish the manly equality qualities of the candidate. With that, I'd like to show you, I think in the interest of time, perhaps just one advertisement so that I can give you a sense of what we're talking about. And we all saw these ads. There are many. We had a hard time choosing. Uh, I'm going to just show you the presence ad, I think. The presence ad, uh, you will recall, I hope, is from the holiday period. And it displays some of the choices that we would have predicted the candidate to make. Now watch all the visual cues. Where did I put universal pre-K? Oh, okay. Ah, there it is. I'm Hillary Clinton and I approve this message. Thank you, Nova. So in that ad, we see a number of things that we would have predicted. First of all, then Senator Clinton is by herself in the ad. She has no family. She's sitting by the Christmas tree in a suit. <laughs> so this is a deliberate decision. This is not a campaign accident. Right, so the candidate is there unencumbered by her family, that dependence motif that she must have been concerned about, presenting as a professional, looking what? At policy choices. And I think it's a very apt uh, piece of communication from the campaign that tips the Clinton hand toward those mo motifs of equality, sameness, policy, competence. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to Regina to bring us home. So, another moment from the campaign that you all remember. The teary moment. This, of course, happens in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, just a couple of days before the, voter, the primary voters in New Hampshire cast their votes. And this was a moment when uh, Clinton was at a diner for a breakfast meeting. Uh, with some uh, voters, and uh, one woman asked her, basically, how do you do it? How do you keep up with this hectic campaign schedule and, imagine, and man manage to sort of get yourself out on the campaign trail in the morning? Oh my goodness, what did I do? <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> I'm sorry, thank you once again. Um, how do you do it? And her response was so interesting, of course, because she says, well, it's not easy. It's not easy. And then as she talks about some of the difficulties, you may recall, her eyes get a little misty. There were no tears, no tears actually flowed, but this moment got an inordinate amount of attention, didn't it? It reveals a couple of things, and one reason we like to focus on it is because it's such a well-remembered moment, and we think it really crystallizes several factors that were all sort of coming together at once. One was, of course, the basic gender stereotyping that was um, just sort of ripe here in this moment, uh, that it was very easy to look at this moment and say, oh, well, there you go, see, she's a woman. And in fact, we opened this chapter of our book with a quote from a reporter at the New York Times, an unnamed reporter who reportedly looked at that moment and said, we're at war, how she, is this how she's gonna respond to Kim Jong-il? You know, is this how she's gonna deal with foreign leaders in a crisis? So that gender stereotype stuff was definitely there, just under the surface. 
at the same time, this became a huge media moment almost gender aside for some very predictable reasons. And that is that the media do tend to focus in very heavily on these defining moments from a campaign, like Michael Dukakis on the tank, uh, like lots of other moments that we can all recall, the Howard Dean scream, for example, um, moments that kind of take on inordinate attention. They carry an ordinate weight in the campaign discourse. So in a sense, almost putting gender aside, this was a guaranteed media moment. But of course, you can't really put gender aside. It's a guaranteed media moment in part because it evokes, oh, Patricia Schroeder, for example, when she decided to uh, fold her campaign for the Democratic nomination years before, had famously cried at the press conference and making that announcement. Um, the other factor I think that it reveals again is the particular particularities of Hillary Clinton. Going back to our Venn diagram, um, the fact that this was Hillary Clinton meant that this moment played out rather differently than it might have for other female candidates. What was Hillary, Hillary Clinton's largest liability with the public? She wasn't often perceived as being very warm, very human. Where was the emotional, real, personable side of the candidate? Many reporters actually, if you will, liked this moment. And many voters apparently liked this moment as well. So this is where we think it's important to keep our eye not just on general gender stereotypes, they're certainly important, but also on the particular candidate. Because in a weird way, the teary moment helped her as much as it hurt her. Um, at least it was certainly widely interpreted to have helped her to win the New Hampshire primary, which was an historic first for a woman to ever win a major party primary contest. Which brings us to <laughs> Sarah Palin, or as it were, Tina Fey <laughs> and Amy Poehler. How do we even begin to talk about Sarah Palin? We can only begin to scratch the surface, and perhaps there'll be some time during Q&A if you have more questions. But obviously, this notion of gender strategy opens up whole new lines of inquiry. And of course, 2008 was fascinating because it gave us the yin and yang of gender strategy, right? Hillary Clinton, with her emphasis mostly on sameness, equality, policy competence and expertise, and Sarah Palin with her beautiful legs, her high heel pumps, her beehive hairdo, and a very different way of communicating and presenting herself, right? Not to mention doubts about her policy expertise, etc. So this for us is a very rich area of inquiry that I think in many ways is still playing out, right? What's going to become of Sarah Palin? Is she going to change any of that gender strategy, change any of that way of presenting herself to audiences in the future should she decide to run again for office. So we're happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have about that. Let's just consider for a moment, I think, a very apt observation by one reporter who said, Senator Clinton is a politician who also happens to be a wife and a mother. Ms. Palin is a wife and mother who also happens to be a politician which kind of captures, again, some of the delicate balancing act that women in the political field have to undertake. Um, we have a variety of other quotes here that kind of capture, we think, some of the complexities swirling around Hillary Clinton versus Sarah Palin. Um, of course, Palin was rather famous for saying, among other things, uh, the heels are on, the gloves are off. I think a very telling statement, she pulls upon that masculinized sports imagery and at the same time brings in a highly, if you will, feminized version of that to say, I'm putting on my high heels and I'm taking off my gloves and I'm going to get into this battle. Um, we also particularly like the comment by, by David Carr of the New York Times that she's a Rachel Ray with a four by four who can not only make a meal in under 30 minutes, but hunt and kill the main course. <laughs> There's something interesting about Sarah Palin because she's good with a gun, right? <laughs> and she kind of doesn't mind being displayed in that way. Well, of course, one thing that opens up here that we can only begin to scratch the surface of is the differences that are available to women based both on party and on the office that they seek. Are there gender strategies available to Republican women that are not available to Democratic women candidates, for example? Aren't there huge differences between seek seeking the vice presidency, which is very much seen as a running mate, a supportive role, uh, and seeking the, place, the seat of power itself in the White House? Lots of interesting uh, uh, material there for us to mine. We would just leave you then with this observation by Gail Sheehy, who followed the uh, 2008 campaign very closely. And I think she really captured the dilemma for the Clinton campaign very concisely. No one knew 
how to run a woman as leader of the free world. It hadn't really been done to this level before. And I think what we've tried to help us appreciate is the many complexities in that, the very complex challenges that faced the Clinton campaign, and indeed the complexities that faced the media in trying to sort out and make sense of that campaign. So with that, we'd like to Mary. begin taking your questions. Some questions. Thank you. cards for you, or um, if you're more comfortable with raising your hand and posing questions, you can do that as well. I know this stirred up a lot of emotion in some of us. I mean, it certainly did for me, and um, I think this uh, speaker series really epitomizes what the center is all about, where it's a very neutral um, academic conversation, but no matter what side of the aisle you're on, it just brings back a lot of memories, which I think is, is interesting. So. Oh. oh, okay, great. Thanks for bringing that up. I guess we can start with uh, reading these off, and then if some would like to come forward or we can bring the microphone to you, um, we can do both. So let's see. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. And um, can you be mindful of time and let me know if we got to wrap things up? Thanks, Nova. Um, traditional versus new media. Is there a difference in coverage? <laughs> Let, I'm, we're going to stand because yes, yes. I'm so short you might not be able to see me even when I'm standing. <laughs> so I'll start yeah. and then I'll let you wrap up on this. I had the unfortunate job of scanning the blogs for the project. So Regina and I had a division of labor around this which of course was required. We were trying to write under a very tight timeline. Uh, and trying to look at different forms of media. And it was my job to look at 14 or 15 different websites um, every week, take snapshots of those, and begin to analyze what I saw there. And, it, and I say it was a very unfortunate job because the worst of the worst lives on those websites and blogs. And what we show in our data, the hard data, of course, is really a very temperate picture of the overall media environment in which Clinton ran. Because the new media is much harder for us to get our arms around because it's so voluminous and the methods for scanning it are new. Um, our, our data there are not as systemic, but I will say that really the ugliest things we saw were in the new media formats and perhaps I'm not sure if this is good news or bad news, but much of the ugliest language we saw in the new media did not bubble its way up into traditional media sources. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a local example of that, if you don't mind, oh, Regina. Um, some of you who worked on the Clinton campaign, and I know there are some of you here, may recall that there was a group in opposition uh, to Clinton which called themselves Citizens United, Not Timid and I'll let you sit with the acronym. Citizens United had a very powerful internet presence in opposition to the Clinton campaign. And when I was interviewed early on in our research process um, by the Oregonian to talk about the kinds of sexism that we were seeing in different forms of media, I shared this story with the reporter who simply said, I can't report that. It just won't get past my editors. I can't, even, even if I spell out the whole name as I do when I'm speaking of, of, of this, I can't put that in the Oregonian. So I'm not sure if that's a qualitatively a good thing or a bad thing that it doesn't bubble all the way up to traditional media sources, but we did see a very serious divide in, in terms of negativity and sexism based on media location. Mm -hmm. You want to say anything about yeah, cable I, news? I think one way I might sort of come at this at a slightly different angle to try to answer your question is that um, I think we see pretty significant differences between the mainstream media coverage and the stuff that happened, again, on cable TV, political talk radio, blogs, uh, websites, et cetera. And I think that, important is distinction, that distinction is important and meaningful, but it's very easy to lose sight of, right? In this day and age especially, we don't even often remember where we heard something, where we saw something. So certain particular things that you might have seen somewhere during the campaign that might have even made you angry or disgusted or offended or whatever, 
those begin to kind of bounce around in this alternate universe of the internet. And really, in a way, if you will, the benefit of the new media and all of this is that there were very active websites really devoted to kind of exposing the very sexist language, the denigrating imagery, et cetera, and kind of bring it to light and kind of you know, compile it and bring, it and, and, and bring attention to it. Um, but I do think at the same time, Ironically enough, I have never written a book that, that hasn't been highly critical of the news media, and yet I would say this is the book I ended up writing that is the least critical of the mainstream news media. I actually think they come off looking pretty well, but maybe that's just in comparison to what, to what was happening um, you know, elsewhere in the new media. That's a great perspective. Here's a good question. Is a woman candidate likely to pay a harsher penalty for missteps than a man? And the two examples um, given were the strategy of being first to claim a momentum did not actually produce momentum, and being discovered as telling wildly inaccurate descriptions of her Bosnia trip. Mm -hmm. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> we, each want, we each want the other to take that one, I think. Um, I would offer, by way of answering, that I think that Americans are very uncomfortable with female ambition, and that we see this in the Clinton candidacy when she claims in a variety of ways, direct and indirect, to be the front runner, the response that was had. Now, that said, being the media scholar, I would predict Regina would say any front runner has a hard time with the press. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, historically, we, we have good data that show that historically the, the quote unquote front runner in a campaign always gets more coverage and more negative coverage, right? They become the target of scrutiny in a way that doesn't happen for the second place candidates, right? So in a way, um, Hillary Clinton had a very unusual position because she leads into the race, not only as the woman candidate, but as the clear front runner by every possible measure, name recognition fundraising, formidable campaign staff and resources, right? She's got everything going for her, which means she was bound to come in for heavy duty scrutiny, right? Now I feel like I've lost the track a little bit of the question. Well, but. the other half of the question as I heard it was also about the, the truthiness issue. <laughs> and uh, so I, and, and, and folks are thinking about the Bosnian fairy tale as mm -hmm. one reporter referred to it. And I, I wonder there too if we also don't have interlocking variables that help explain that as well. Mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, one could make an argument um, that there are deeply ingrained stereotypes about, um, about women's veracity uh, deeply ingrained stereotypes that go back centuries, centuries in Western history about women's uh, ability to be rational as opposed to emotional. So I think that in some ways it, it positions a female candidate even worse to be slippery with the truth than it would a male comparator. But we also have news media norms mm -hmm. that help explain that response as well. And we have the particular variable of Hillary Clinton. That's right. This became another example, I think, that added to a long line of examples of Clintonian truth bending, if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, she and her husband have both been known for that. So I think that there's a sense in which this plays out at all three levels. Mm -hmm. So it, to some degree, to try to answer the question succinctly, it's a problem that's going to be faced probably by all female candidates. Um, on the other hand, there were particular hurdles, I think, for Clinton that may have been a little steeper, shall we say. There's such great questions in here, I don't even know where to start. But um, I'll take this one next. Reading about gender politics and the media makes me wonder about Speaker Pelosi's relationship with the media. Oh, that's a good uh, one. Can you comment a bit on that? <laughs> well, I mean, she's a, she's a very interesting figure, isn't she? I mean, speaking of gender strategy, there's an interesting person who really hasn't lost the trappings of femininity. She has um, openly presented herself as a grandmother, for example, and uh, looks always very nice in her pearls and her suits, et cetera, and has a very, in a way, very feminine way about her, even though she's known to be tough as nails, right? Um, she, she has had an interesting relationship with the press that to some degree takes us outside of our, our discussion here. Um, but I think she's a wonderful comparison case, right, for someone like Hillary Clinton because she's another historic first. And in fact, it's fascinating that we've really had so many female firsts in relatively quick succession on the national stage. And I think the obvious next step that somebody needs to do <laughs> is to, to really closely compare 
uh, coverage of all of those and try to see what are the patterns and what are the differences that have to do with the individual woman herself, right? Mm -hmm. And there too, I would just point out that it's different to be elected by your peers than it is to be elected by the public. Mm -hmm. So there we have a system that looks more like a parliamentary system than a presidency okay. system because you're being lifted up by your own peers to that position of leadership within the legislative body, which incurs a whole different level of interactivity with the media than running for the presidency would. Yeah. Was there a way to discount the bill factor, which won't happen to other future candidates? <laughs> Is there a way to discount the I, bill I factor? take from that question that the what we hear oftentimes when we talk about the book, which is how much of the challenge was due to the fact that she was married to a particular person. And I think there's no way around this. Most female candidates for the presidency are not going to have happened to be married to a former U.S. president. So I think that we get this question in a variety of forms. And I think what, if I understand the intent, it's usually about, you know, is Hillary unique? so unique that we can't draw any lessons from her experience. And I would say, it, maybe in my uh, ornery way, any woman who makes it that far is going to be unique in some fashion. That the first US president who is a female is going to have some form of unique profile by definition of her ability to get there. So in this particular case, we have a, a woman who had been married to a, who is married to a former president. And that came with a lot of baggage, which originally was thought to be an advantage, and which turned in very unpredictable ways, as we all know, having watched it. Mm -hmm. so. We have three questions here asking about why is it this way in the United States <laughs> when there don't seem to be the barriers internationally. Mm -hmm. We have Golda Meir, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, Margaret, Thatcher as examples, um, first world, third world countries that seem to overcome this barrier. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that and how the media plays a role internationally? I'm going to tell a silly little anecdote and then I'm going to let Melody give the, the serious answer. You all remember the image of Michael Dukakis on the tank? Do you know what that was modeled after? That was modeled after Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> right, you know, who, who also ran a similar sort of ad in uh, one of her earlier campaigns, only I believe she was wearing a long flowing scarf <laughs> as she was driving a tank. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> go ahead. I, I, have, I have some thoughts on this. <laughs> I think, uh, first of all, we are slipping behind. So that's one thing to know, and, and many of you probably do. We are slipping behind in the percentage of women represented in the US government vis-a-vis -vis other Western democracies, and even other countries in the world that are not democracies. So we are slipping behind very quickly on those lists in terms of women's inclusion in elected office. So there is something going on in the US case that requires explanation. And I think that there are a couple of things here. Um, the most important for those of us who study American politics, uh, is that we have a presidential system, not a parliamentary system. And this is widely understood to be a component in holding women back from the highest executive office. And the reason is fairly simple. Uh, in most parliamentary systems, the way one rises to the chief uh, executive position is through a legislative body, through assistance, through that legislative body, through one's colleagues. And that, to some degree, based on the nation, uh, can shield one from the same level of media exposure and um, inquiry. The other thing about the American system is that we have two political parties. And the rest of the Western dem democratic world has many more political parties. And there are some pretty good theories about how that holds non-traditional candidates back in the American case. So there are some pretty important structural differences about the American system from others that I think are relevant here. And that doesn't even get us into things like culture and religion and uh, all of the rest. We have time for one more. Okay. Um, should we open it up to someone, anyone who wants to raise their hand with a question? Would you like the microphone? Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent presentations. 
Uh, two very quick questions. One of them is, uh, there seems to be an independent variable missing, and that is that Hillary Clinton was running against Barack Obama, who ran an exceptional campaign. Had Obama deferred until 2012, for example, Clinton probably would have been the clear forerunner, and if so, would her campaign not have been different? Would it not have been organized differently and presented differently? And the second uh, comment I'm required to make because of my position, and that is that in the Muslim world, uh, three women have been elected as heads of state, um, and this is the sort of thing that runs contrary to stereotypes that we in the West have about the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd love to take a second. I love the first question, that, not that I don't like the second observation, but I love the first question that you asked because it's like the gorilla in the room here, right, that we're all sort of acknowledging. This was not just any old election. This was, this was a campaign against Barack Obama, probably one of the most skilled politicians that, to, you know, to ever come along. So that created all kinds of specific challenges, and it's what we try to capture in that Venn diagram of that big bubble that's lender, uh, labeled the candidate and her context. <laughs> Hillary Clinton's context was very unexpectedly to her campaign because at the beginning of the race, she really didn't think much of the rest of the field. She didn't think she had serious competition. So he turns out to be a, a rather unexpected challenge to her. Great question. Would her campaign have been different? I guess I would hazard, hazard a guess that the um, testosterone blitzkrieg that we saw in March would have been unnecessary because probably had Barack Obama not been in the race and just the rest of the Democratic field as it was, I think it's pretty clear she probably would have won the nomination and won it rather easily. I mean, these are dangerous predictions to make, but it's in the past, so I guess it's easier for me to say. So that means maybe that the, the really masculinized side of the message would not have, have been emphasized to the same degree, right? Um, that's one possibility. Well, I would say too, just and, and thank you, Dr. Beck told my colleague uh, who studies Middle East politics, thank you very much for the question. I, I think this too, calls to mind the challenges we had in writing this book uh, as the events were unfolding. And we had to account for Obama's candidacy in a way that we had not intended to need to account for it. And it was a great challenge methodologically for us, uh, even substantively, because we had to gather data that we weren't expecting to have to gather. And it made for a rich conversation between Regina and me, because the other thing it inserts in this whole conversation that we haven't raised is the issue of race. Mm -hmm. And how would these issues of double binds for female candidates manifest differently for a woman of color? So that's another aspect mm -hmm. of this that we have a great level of interest in. I, mean, I think it's important to recognize that there were certain benefits to her because of her makeup uh, and that we can't go on, they can't go unsaid. So I think it's important what you've raised. We did try to accommodate that variable within the context uh, bubble on the Venn diagram. Thank you. Perfect way to close. <laughs> well, I want to thank, thank Dr. Lawrence and Dr. Rose for an engaging debate or discussion. Sorry. Nova has, on behalf of the center, we want to thank you both for being <laughs> our you. inaugural speakers. Thank, thank you. So sweet. Is okay with the <laughs> <laughs> and does everybody know Nova Newcomer, oh, those who's involved really with the center? She's the head of chapter or outreach, and is involved with this as, as well as Trish Hamilton and Rod Johnson with Portland State. We want to thank them for their work on this. So I don't know about you, but um, I think I understand what the speaker series is all about now. I am motivated to go back to school, and guess what? <laughs> I don't have time or the capacity to do that. So if you're feeling the same way, I just want to um, pose a couple opportunities for you to um, stay involved with the center. One is that uh, we want you to tell people about this event and your experiences with it, um, because that's how we can better brand the organization and have a more positive effect on the community. We'd love for you to recommend people to our programs, university women uh, to new leadership, as well as high school age women to uh, teens lead. Stay in touch, come to more events, we'd love to have you. Uh, ideas to collaborate. I know many of you represent fantastic women's organizations and we look to work with a lot of you. Um, so keep those in mind. 
And if you are inspired and you have the means at this moment to make a, ch a contribution to our center, we have some gift envelopes in the back. Um, and if now is not the time to do it, it's um, just spending time with us and uh, ideas is, is just as meaningful and significant to our organization. So with that, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to the next speaker series. Books in the back, if you would like to purchase one, and of course they will be autographed. Uh, makes a wonderful gift. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.